Thanks, Nick, and can I say what a pleasure it is to be here tonight to introduce my good friend, David Kemp. Uh, David, it's this one thing that you and I and Samuel Griffiths have in common. We were all education ministers. He was a Queensland education minister and we were both federal education ministers. Uh, he was also known as Oily Sam and was meant to be able to argue both sides of a case very well. So hopefully as politicians we were a little bit different to, to Samuel Griffiths, but uh, time will tell when it comes to me, I think, on that. Um, the other thing which was really interesting when I was doing some study on Samuel Griffiths was the role that the 1891 shearing strike had on his political career. Now, for those who don't know, the 1891 shearing strike was a strike about whether non-union labour could participate in the Australian shearing industry. And Samuel Griffiths was one of the fierce defenders of saying that non-unionised labour should be able to participate in shearing in Australia. To the extent that his government sent the three leaders of that strike to jail for three years in 1891. <laughs> and that's, I think, when he no longer became Oily Sam and became Sam of serious conviction. <laughs> it is, it's interesting to see what role the shearing industry has played uh, in Australian political life. Those of you who can remember the defining other strike, which was the wide comb dispute which occurred in Australia in the late 1980s. And that dispute, which I remember well as a young boy who grew up on a farm and was required after school to go and work in the shearing shed when we were shearing, pitted shearer against shearer again. There were those shearers who didn't want to have to bend over a sheep for as long as was needed by extending the width of their comb. And the union, of course, didn't want this productivity increase to occur in the shearing industry and fought to keep the combs narrow. And I'll never forget in our shearing shed, you had shearers side by side on their stands, one using a narrow cone because they were loyal to the union and the other using a wide cone and one could shear 150 sheep in a day and the other 100 due to the fact that they were able to use a wider comb. Now that of course led to the formation of the NFF led to such things as the Mudgeonbury dispute where the meat industry and the meat union was defeated and led to the Liberal side of politics on the back of the formation of the NFF and others to really focus on an agenda for this nation that would set it up for the future. And that agenda led to the election in 1996 of the Howard government and some of the great reforming ministers that this nation has ever seen. And David Kemp was one of those. And that's why, David, it's an absolute honour to introduce you tonight because you were a reformer when it came to education, you were a reformer when it came to employment and you were a reformer in arguing for tax reform and you were a reformer when it came to making sure that we got the industrial relations changes that this nation needed to improve our productivity and add wealth to our nation. But it's not only that that you've made a significant contribution to. Your passion and knowledge and a historical documenting of the Liberal Party 
and the liberal side of politics over the decades is true testimony to your ability to give back to who we are as liberals. And can I say that more of us need to make sure that we're giving back? Because at this time, the liberal cause is under threat in many, many ways. And we need people like David who have made such a significant contribution to keep giving back. Because if we don't, then the task falls on fewer and fewer and becomes harder and harder. So if I could ask you all please to give David Kemp a huge round of applause for the contribution that he has made to the right side of politics in this nation. And if I could ask you all please to look at the exemplar that he is. Someone who was prepared after his career had finished to become president of the Victorian Liberal Party. Not a job that many people want to put their hands up for. <laughs> Someone who is still writing about liberalism in this nation. Someone who understands the importance of the broad church on the right side of politics. Someone who I think, along with John Howard, has probably made the greatest contribution to liberal life in this nation. David, it's a great honour to introduce you tonight. <laughs> Well, I was going to say, Dan, um, thank you very much for that kind introduction, but um, uh, I feel a bit uh, like Malcolm Muggeridge, uh, who, when he was introduced uh, extraordinarily enthusiastically <coughs> by the person uh, chairing the uh, lecture, said, um, thank you very much for that, but I can hardly wait to hear what I'm going to say. <laughs> Uh, it's very good of you to, to make those comments and I shall try to remember them when I have a sleepless nights. Today has been a, a very interesting day. I attended the morning session and I must say we've heard some superlative papers uh, and they are papers that have focused very much on the legal issues that arise with the constitutional voice. It seemed to me that one thing that came out of those papers was that there is enormous uncertainty about how the, a constitutionalised voice will be dealt with by the High Court. I, I, I enjoyed all the papers, um, but I have to say that the one that... Um, I think really uh, we'll think of for a long time out of uh, this conference is the paper that Alan Myers gave. And Alan demonstrated uh, the extent to which spiritual beliefs, unassisted by evidence, can be adopted by the High Court as in the Love case, as a basis for limiting the Commonwealth's express powers. And he showed how in the Palmer case, the court showed that it was willing to interpret clear words in the Constitution, as in section 92, which for those who were not there, to remind you says that Trade, commerce and intercourse between the states shall be absolutely free. And the High Court's interpretation of that was that those words meant not absolutely free. <laughs> Political life and, of course, elections and referenda are all about uncertainty and solving problems 
of uncertainty that we all feel about the future and about the problems and issues and values that, that concern us. And what I want to talk about tonight is why the proposed constitutional voice has some very strange characteristics in the politics. I'm going to argue tonight that really in deciding about the voice, it is certainly relevant to know what the politics of the High Court are, but it is also relevant to know why we are being confronted with a proposal of this kind at this stage in our history. Because there's no doubt that the voice itself is not as a proposal offering policy certainty. So it stands in a rather peculiar position in the politics of the country where governments usually spend a great deal of time trying to give confidence and certainty to the people that they govern. And one might well ask, well, why is this? Why are we being confronted with a voice that is uncertain in how it's going to be dealt with legally? And what other, in particular, what other politics going to be surrounding that voice? What will its effect be on the political life of our country? What will its effect be on Indigenous communities in Australia and on Indigenous people generally in Australia? The legal view um, in favour of the voice I thought was clearly expressed by former Chief Justice French in his paper when he described the voice as high return, low risk. High return, low risk. And of course his paper, like legal papers probably appropriately are, focused on legal issues. And he didn't give a lot of consideration, I think, in that paper to the politics that have led to the voice being presented to us and that are likely to follow the implementation of the voice. Now, I'm afraid tonight that I'm going to take a um, very negative view of the voice and this proposal. And I've noted, however, and we'll try to follow the lead of um, Alan Myers and the lawyers who have spoken to us today and speak about this whole matter with courtesy, about the people involved, and I'll certainly seek to remain courteous at all times as I do so. The politics of the voice are peculiar for a number of reasons. But I'm going to argue in this paper that they are mainly have the character they have because of the political culture of Australia at the present time. Because the extraordinary feature of the voice is that it reverses the demands of Indigenous leaders in this country since the, at least the 1930s. And they are demands for equal citizenship. Their demands to be treated like all other Australians, to have the rights and the respect that is due to anybody who is an Australian. And until a very large gathering of Indigenous people from a whole variety of backgrounds got together to draft the Uluru Statement and negotiate that statement, that was the position of Aboriginal and Indigenous Australia. And yet now, it's changed, at least amongst those leaders behind the Uluru Statement who've come out now and got the government to put it before us. And why is the government putting this forward at the present time when it is not something that is giving certainty to the country but is giving uncertainty and is in fact dividing not just Australians generally, but it's divided the Indigenous community. And we're hearing voices, radical voices, uh, like Lydia Thorpe and Thomas Mayo, and we're hearing more moderate voices supporting it, the, the, the voice as well, 
And we're hearing people like Jacinta Price and Warren Mundine arguing very strongly that there is another Australia, the Australia that Indigenous people have been asking for through their leadership for many decades, that has a much better chance of giving certainty to the future of the country and to Indigenous communities. It's come forward, I think, and this is the general political comment with which I'll preface my remarks, that given the history of referenda, it's very puzzling that the government hasn't made any serious attempt at bipartisanship. Throughout this debate, the government has rigorously kept to the most extensive and extreme views of how the proposal should be framed in the referendum. And it's rejected really any sensible discussions with groups like um, Uphold and Recognise, uh, and even ministers within the government itself urging that maybe some modification of the proposal could be made. In this case, we've got politics demanding certainty for the government by the government. It wants to make sure that it has the support of a group of leaders in the Indigenous community. But even if it believed, and this is just a political judgment that I make, that even if the government believed that there could be no bipartisan position on this voice, that the voice itself um, would be one that um, the opposition in the end would be blamed for if the referendum were defeated, and that would be a political plus for the government. The effort to achieve bipartisanship would have strengthened the government's moral position. But I think it's very hard to get away from the proposition that the Prime Minister doesn't care whether the voice is won or lost. That he's throwing a lot of money at it, but so much could have been done to secure more support for the voice. I don't say it would ever have won, it may win, it may lose. But more could have been done and seen to be done that was not done. And it's clear that in the short term, the government is hoping to get good politics out of the referendum. In other words, the interest of the politicians is taking precedence over the interest of the country. But secondly, I believe, and this is a pathway that in fact leads me to refer back to Samuel Griffith, it's even more puzzling that the arguments that are being offered for the voice are so thin. And my focus in these remarks is really going to be on how weak the yes case is. The yes case seems to be a series of key words and phrases that will evoke support amongst some groups, the government hopes the majority. Andrew Breitbart said that um, politics is downstream of culture. And that doesn't tell us where culture comes from, which is through institutions, but there are three cultural ideas that are very prevalent in Australia at the moment, two of which came from Samuel Griffith's time and one came from the foundation of modern Australia at the time of the Enlightenment when the first fleet arrived. One idea that's common to then and now is identity politics. In Griffith's time, it was class war. It was the capitalists against the workers. It was the exploiters against the industrial victims of the time. And that, of course, was lay behind the Shearer strike. And what happened there happened because Griffith was a vigorous defender of the rule of law and the belief that justice related not to relations between races and groups, but relations between individual people. Griffith was a true liberal in that sense, 
and his liberalism and his enforcement of it in the strikes has been resented by the Labor Party ever since. But another idea was born at that time as well, and that was that the Labor Party was formed at the time of the strikes, and its general approach to politics was a group versus an individual approach. It was a, the corporate state that appealed to Labor. And the more it could organise society, unions, businessmen, and now it seems Indigenous people, into groups that will act as groups and see their interests as either Indigenous people or races, that's an improvement in politics because that kind of politics is easier for certain kinds of politics who like negotiation with representative groups to handle. The idea of a society which is free to develop opportunity to create a world where every individual, Indigenous and not Indigenous, have opportunities is not one that is foremost in the government's thinking. And so we have in the appeal of the S case collective nouns like Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, which permeate the discussion to the point of implying the great importance of race and ancestry in an age when liberal principle points us to the fact that we need to make such distinctions less, not more entrenched. The need for better consultation is emphasised, as if there have not been enormous improvements in consultation and consultative principles and practices over the last decade uh, between governments uh, and Indigenous people and companies and Indigenous people. The argument that recognition is not real if it's not embodied in a constitutional voice greatly undervalues the quality of the recognition that's already been achieved by Indigenous people over the last half century. Current policy frameworks are said to have failed. That's why we need the voice. But to say that is to ignore the enormous progress that's taken place in the condition of constitutional people in Australia over the last half century. So identity politics, corporate politics, two very powerful ideas. But the most powerful idea at the moment, which explains why we have support for the voice coming from corporates who never put out a statement explaining why they're supporting it, other than repeating these key word phrases, uh, why the ABC seems to think it is the only position that needs to be properly presented on the national broadcaster, why the universities have come out and supported the constitutional voice without ever putting out a workable and admirable academic statement about why they have done so, I think betraying, basically betraying their role that they should play in the wider community by mouthing slogans and not helping people to make rational and sensible decisions. These features of the debate are explicable, I think, by one powerful feature of our current political culture. And it's, it's a feature which has always been an element of our political culture, but is probably stronger now than ever. And that is the humanitarianism that has been an incredibly powerful element in the official positions of governments since Arthur Phillip landed at Sydney Cove. His first interest was in keeping the convicts away from the Indigenous people because the Indigenous people would be so disgusted with the behaviour of the people that Britain had brought to Australia. <laughs> Later governors followed, trying to pretend to themselves and convince themselves that in fact Indigenous people had now become full British citizens and were entitled to all the rights of British citizens. The problem was the cultural gulf was so big that that could not be enforced. When the failure of that initial 
very liberal, open, enlightenment approach was clear, this humanitarian country turned to protecting the Aborigines from the violence of the settlers. And they set up, unfortunately for the Indigenous people, protection regimes, some of whom, and it varied from state to state, but some of whom decided that the approach was to classify the Aborigines by race and to restrict their citizenship rights and indeed to remove any children who looked like Europeans from their control. Western Australia was the worst case of that and Paul Hasluck made it his life's mission to attempt to repeal and get rid of any suggestion of race in the policies towards Aboriginal people and focus on need. These, uh, this humanitarian uh, principle, va value, virtue in our political culture is, of course, a basic source of the demonstration of virtue. And what we have is a society at the moment where the major institutions are virtue signalling in a way that we have rarely seen before in the belief that it is enough to say that the Aboriginal people of this country deserve what they ask for. And if the leaders are demanding what they ask for, then we must go along with that. It is an absolutely disgraceful example of how those who should be standing in favour of a rational and liberal society are prepared to support a policy that has been put forward without any substantial rational argument at all. If we look at the constant use of this language of soft racism that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples are two peoples who somehow or other are distinctive and unique and deserve special constitutional rights. It's well to remind ourselves that the diversity of Aboriginal people is astonishing in Australia. People with Aboriginal heritage today are drawn from many ethnic, national and cultural backgrounds. The 2021 census recorded that of the 813,000 people identified at the time as having an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander ancestry, of these 516,000 or 63% also had other ancestries including some 200,000 recording their English, Scots, Welsh and Irish ancestry and another 277,000 noting other undifferentiated Australian ancestry. Whether that leaves some 300,000 people with Indigenous heritage and only Indigenous heritage is unclear. Again, it's important to note that 80% of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in Australia live in major cities and in the nearby regions. Only one in five people in that demographic category live in remote communities. And of course, it's in these remote communities that communal dysfunction, violence and the abuse of Aboriginal children is most severe and Surely that's where policy needs to be directed. The voice, I regret to say, is a tragic overreach that will set back but not end the long and to this point successful road to appropriate recognition. It's based on a distortion of who Australians with an Indigenous heritage actually are in Australia and it's not at all surprising that those with such heritage are divided in their attitudes towards the proposal. I think one of the consequences of this debate that we're really about to enter in with full voice, if I can make that pun, is that <laughs> 
the qu very question of what is recognition is finally going to be properly discussed. What is recognition? The upshot of the government's tactic is to assert that the voice is the only form of recognition that is appropriate. And that will almost certainly have the effect of putting recognition under the spotlight. The ideas spelt out in the longer version of the Uluru Statement, the 26 page or 18 page, 26 page version of the Uluru Statement, which according to the ABC doesn't exist as the Uluru Statement, but I can assure you having downloaded and looked at it and I've seen it well before, it actually does exist and it is called the Uluru Statement. And we think of the claims of radicals whose names I've mentioned. These will all further throw the meaning of recognition into doubt. Will there ever be recognition until the most radical version is satisfied? I'd like to answer confidently, no, there will never be recognition until the most radical version is satisfied. And I must admit that Alan Meyer's paper today makes me really worried that the High Court will increasingly find a distinctive Aboriginal sovereignty to build on the Love case, and it will adopt an attitude of um, great breadth in interpreting what it says are the powers of Parliament. If you look at what's happened over the last half century, it is extraordinary what has happened. In 1962, all people of Aboriginal heritage, men and women, were confirmed in their voting rights in federal elections, and the states were to follow. In 2017, when the Uluru Statement was issued, there were four Indigenous members of the federal parliament. Today, there are now 11 with Indigenous heritage, constitutional voices in parliament, lawmakers, more than able to represent the interests of Indigenous people in their electorates. One of the greatest acts of recognition, of course, was the Native Title Act that occurred in 1993. And that was negotiated with Indigenous leaders. In fact, if you looked at that whole negotiation closely, you might think it was a Makarata or even the signing of a treaty. I think it was a great thing to have happened, though I was not a supporter at the time. It was a great thing because effectively it dealt with the dispossession. And it is an embarrassment, I think, and you hardly ever hear it mentioned in the debate today going on that this act, extraordinary piece of legislation exists, which now provides native title over some 16% of the continent, that provides native title over about 30% of Queensland and 50% of the Northern Territory, where most people living, most Indigenous people in rural communities live. So what has happened now is that Indigenous people have been welcomed fully into the community. I don't think anyone here would question that whether they enjoy welcomes to country or not, it nevertheless is the case that there is tremendous respect in this community for Indigenous Australia. And in part, that's been built on the Racial Discrimination Act of 1975, which for the first time made unlawful discrimination in employment, accommodation, provision of goods and services, membership, housing and education. In terms of social and economic progress today, there are now between 12,000 and 16,000 Indigenous-owned businesses, with a similar distribution across industry types as non-Indigenous businesses. There are over 25,000 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders in professional occupations, including over 600 solicitors and a similar number of health practitioners. In 2018, there were 18,062 Indigenous higher education students, 
around 89% of Indigenous Year 3 students in major cities, 89%, met or were above national minimum literacy and numeracy standards. It's surely time to cease talking as if there'd been no recognition that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are still waiting for recognition. And for some reason or other, the only recognition that they will find acceptable is the voice. And it's hard to avoid the feeling, I find it hard to avoid the feeling, that the reason why it is necessary, according to these leaders, to accept the voice is because behind the voice there is a long agenda that had to be clearly discussed and negotiated and to some extent conceded at Uluru. And that is an agenda which emphasises nationhood and sovereignty and reparations and identity politics drawing on this country's deep tradition of humanitarianism seeks to turn it into a division between a distinctive indigenous people and the rest of the country. One of the government's last claims that I'll mention is that the voice will produce a better implementation of the national agreement on closing the gap. And I can, can't do better than quote the former chairman of the Productivity Commission, Michael Brennan, who wrote recently in the Australian Financial Review that for Indigenous people, when you look at their record and history, government has often been the problem, not the solution. There is a troubled history of past government policies, Brennan wrote, and more recently the dysfunction of services imposed on communities without coordination or real evaluation. Brennan admittedly did see the 2020 National Agreement as an improvement and a big step forward, inviting closer cooperation, but he concluded that there was little evidence that the government was yet delivering. Although Brennan conceded that real reform takes time, quote, we should by now have seen some clear steps in the right direction. Unfortunately, the Commission found that engagement in consultation structures can very often feel tokenistic, ticking the box, while under existing funding models, it is government that specifies the outputs and onerous reporting requirements. Brennan asked, can the government change its ways? Closing the gap, even the national agreement, cannot break free from the bureaucratic, centralised, authoritative approach to Indigenous policy. I think there's good reason to answer Brennan's question in this way, no. Government must be accountable, it's true, and for that it does need rigorous financial accountability. The problem is that in the absence of flexibility, there can be little or no innovation outside approved programs. Government is a system that relies on authority, and authority demands conformity. It's no good at producing a great deal of free, and mutually cooperative diversity in a liberal society. That's why liberals like government, officially at least, to be minimal in size. Yet closing the gap proposes a massive increase in government intervention in Indigenous communities. And I think we can be absolutely certain that it will not succeed in closing the gap or bringing Indigenous Australians to a comparable level with other Australians according to their own wishes. <laughs>
The future of Australians with Indigenous heritage, in my view, has been caught up in a cultural frenzy of national virtue signalling and soft racism. Despite the good intentions of many of the supporters of The Voice, the claim of special rights for consultation and advice for Indigenous people as a separate category of citizens will tend to force many issues into a racial framework that will corrupt our political culture and divert our attention from what really matters, which is the dignity of each individual citizen and that policy should be aimed for equal opportunities for all Australians and directed in a free and flexible society towards overcoming need. Thank you.